with your abundant favor and blessings as your servants whom you have been pleased to call to leadership positions in this republic. We seek guidance to treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of our country and of those whose interests you have committed to our charge. Amen. Your Excellency, Honorable Uhuru Kenyatta, CGH, President of the Republic of Kenya, and Commander-in-Chief of the Kenya Defense Forces. The right Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, Honorable Justin B. Muturi, EGH MP, Honorable Members of Parliament, Article 1321B of the Constitution of Kenya requires the President to address a special sitting of the Parliament of Kenya once every year and any other time. Further, Article 1321C requires the President to in earlier report in an address to the, to the nation all the measures taken and the progress achieved in the realization of the national values set out in Article 10 of the Constitution. In addition, Article 2407 of the Constitution requires the President in his capacity as the Chairperson of the National Security Council, NCC, to report to Parliament annually on the state of the security of Kenya. In this regard, pursuant to Article 1321B and C1 and 2 of the Constitution and Senate Standing Order Number 2221 and 2, upon a request by the President, write a letter reference number OP stock CAB 2612A, dated 19th November 2021, I gave notice of today's special sitting to the Honorable Senator's Vite Gazette Notice number 12989, which was published on Friday, 26 November 2021. Accordingly, Honorable Members, this special sitting is properly convened. I thank you. Your Excellency, Honorable Uhuru Kenyatta, CGH, President of the Republic of Kenya and Commander in Chief of the Kenya Defense Forces, the Honorable Speaker of the Senate, Right Honorable Senator Kenneth Lusaka, EGH, Honorable Members of Parliament, Article 132, Clause 1 of the Constitution of Kenya requires the President to address a special sitting of Parliament once every year and at any other time. Further, Article 132, Clause 1, Paragraph C requires the President once every year, report in an address to the nation on measures taken and progress achieved in the realization of our national values. Additionally, at Kowanda, the two close one, paragraph C, Roman 3, provides that the president shall submit a report for debate in the National Assembly on the progress made in fulfilling the international obligations of the Republic. In this regard, honorable members, by way of a message to the House dated 19th of November 2021, His Excellency the President conveyed his desire to address a joint sitting of the Houses of Parliament today, 30th of November 2021. Consequently, pursuant the provisions of Article 132, Clause 1, Paragraph B and C, Romans 1 and 2 of the Constitution, and the provisions of Standing Order Number 22 of the National Assembly Standing Orders, by Gazette Notice Number 12823, which was published in the Kenya Gazette on 23rd of November 2021, I gave notice to this of this special sitting to the members of the National Assembly. Accordingly, on of members, this special sitting is properly convened. Your Excellency. Allow me, in the usual parliamentary practice, to recognize part of the distinguished guests who are with us today. Seated in the speaker's role, I wish to recognize His Excellency, the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, 
Dr. William Ruto, EGH, the Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya, the Honorable Lady Justice Martha Kome, CBS, the former Prime Minister, and, and the African Union's High Representative for, for Infrastructure Development in Africa, the Right Honorable Raila Molodinga, PGH. Former Vice President of the Republic of Kenya, the Honorable Dr. Stephen Kalonzo Musioka, EGH, and the Honorable Musalia Mudavadi, EGH, and the Chairperson of the Council of Governors, who is also the Governor of Embu County, the Honorable Martin Wambora, EGH. Please join me, Honorable Members, in welcoming them to the National Assembly. Your Excellency, allow me also to welcome other members of the judiciary present today, including the Honorable Lady Justice Njoki Ndungo, Judge of the Supreme Court, Justice Daniel Musinga, President of the Court of Appeal, Lady, Lady Justice Lydia Achonde of the High Court, and Justice Oscar Angote, and Lady Justice Maureen Onyango. Your Excellency, may I also accord special recognition to all cabinet secretaries present, the head of the public service, Dr. Joseph Kinyua, principal secretaries, the governor of, Na of Nairobi City County, Honorable Anne Kananu, members of the diplomatic corps present, and the chairperson of the county assemblies forum, who's also the speaker of the county assembly of Nyandarwa, the Honorable Wahome Dewa. You are all welcome to parliament. Honorable members, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is now my singular honor and privilege to invite His Excellency the President of the Republic of Kenya and Commander-in-Chief of the Kenya Defense Forces to address this special sitting of Parliament. Welcome, Your Excellency. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, the Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, the Honorable Speaker of the Senate, Honorable Members of Parliament, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, indeed it is my distinct honor and high privilege to once again return to the Chambers of Parliament to deliver my eighth State of the Nation address since my assumption of office as the fourth president of the Republic of Kenya on Tuesday, 9th of April, 2013. As always, it is a great pleasure to return to this august house where I have had the opportunity to serve on both sides of the parliamentary divide, indeed with many of you who are present here today. I first served as a nominated member of parliament introduced into this chamber by the Honorable Raila Odinga and the Honorable Musalia Mudavadi. And later as a cabinet minister. And after an unsuccessful presidential bid in 2002, I found myself on the opposition benches as the leader of the official opposition and Member of Parliament for Gatundu South. Five years later, I was called to serve as Deputy Prime Minister in the Grand Coalition Government under His Excellency, the former President, Honorable Mwai Kibaki, and the Honorable Prime Minister, Right Honorable Raila Odinga. In that position, in that administration, I held two positions, the Minister of Trade, and later the Minister of Finance. 
This journey of mixed fortunes taught me that you could serve your country in any capacity because service is not a position, it is action. It also taught me to have empathy for both sides of the parliamentary divide and indeed all shades of political opinion. Of all the lessons, the enduring one is that Kenya is always greater than any one of us. Indeed, in times of great political turmoil, men and women must be spurred by the love of their country to bridge partisan divides and to come together to put Kenya first. It is not always easy, but honorable members, it is necessary. Then as now, we are called upon to do all that, it, that all that is necessary to heal Kenya, to build bridges, and to focus on the 99% of shared visions of a better Kenya as a priority to the 1% of differing ideologies and positions. Personal ambitions were placed aside for the good of Kenya and the enduring benefit of generations of Kenyans yet unborn. And that selfless service, that sacrifice, led to the people of Kenya ultimately working together bestowing upon me the high honor and extreme privilege of serving them as president in 2002. For the trust and faith that the great people of Kenya placed on me, I am and will forever be most grateful and internally humbled. Mr. Speaker, today I return to Parliament as president and I am here to fulfill a constitutional imperative introduced into our political tradition and practice by the 2010 Constitution. In fact, I was indeed privileged to be the second president to be discharged this constitutional mandate when I first made my first State of the Nation address on the 27th of March 2014. The Constitution at Article 132 mandates the president to report to a special joint sitting of both houses of parliament on measures taken and progress made in the realization of our national values as defined by Article 10 of our Constitution. I am also constitutionally obliged to report on the status of our fulfillment of the international obligations of the Republic and the state of our national security and the general state of the nation. In line with this constitutional instruction, my address today will lay emphasis on three elements that I consider important to our country. The first is the state of our economic development, which is about our national well-being. The second is the state of our social structure, which looks at the restoration and propagation of the dignity of our people. And the third is the state of our nationhood, which speaks to the soul of our nation, including the state of our democracy. Before I report on these thematic areas, allow me, ladies and gentlemen, and honorable members, to give a brief account on the state of our national response to emerging disruptions. Specifically, I want to now put on record how the power of choice on the part of our administration, as supported by Parliament and indeed the county governments, turned the COVID-19 pandemic from a national crisis to what I believe is an intergenerational opportunity. Mr. Speakers, when the pandemic hit our country in March of 2020, we were quick to warn the nation that a crisis is twinfold. It is partly a danger and partly an opportunity at the same stroke. I highlighted the inescapable fact that depending on what you focus on in a crisis, you can either emerge triumphant or indecisive 
out of fear and despair. In other words, a crisis is indeed all about choices. Those who choose danger and fear do not survive. Those who see the crisis through the lens of opportunity develop resilience and are able to build back better. And I say this because, for instance, a Kenyan company known as Revital, operating in Kilifi County in the coast region, became Africa's largest producer and exporter of vaccine syringes during the COVID period. In 2020 alone, Revital exported 70 million COVID syringes to over 20 countries globally. In fact, Revital currently has the capacity to produce 300 million COVID vaccine syringes every year. The global shortage for COVID vaccine syringes stands at 2 billion, and this itself is taking advantage of opportunity. This means that Revital is able to produce one out of every 10 COVID vaccine syringes globally. The company saw opportunity in the crisis of COVID, adopted accordingly, and innovated its business processes to optimize on the new opportunity. Another company in the same league is Hela, a global apparel making company with a foothold here in Kenya. In the first months of the pandemic, this company changed its strategy from producing clothes to producing PPEs and face masks. With the WHO requirements of 80 million face masks per month at the height of COVID duress, Hella produced 5 million masks a month between April and May 2020. This means that through innovation, Hella manufactured one out of 16 masks required globally every month, contributing immensely to the slowing down of the COVID pandemic. This again was a case of seeing opportunity in a disaster and adopting to the changes. However, choices are nothing without leadership. And I say this because when COVID-19 hit our country, my administration found itself confronted with a dilemma of two rights. Opinion was sharply divided on whether to lock down the country or to leave it open. On one side of the divide, they presented an economic argument. They warned us that to leave the country open, they advised us to leave the country open and save the economy. And they argued that COVID was a health crisis that should not trump economic imperatives. The other side of the divide made a compelling health argument against the economic argument. Led by a brain trust of medical scientists and researchers they argued that the country had no option but to lock down. Their models pointed to a soaring crisis if drastic choices were not made. According to these experts, a series of irreducible minimums had to be met before considering softer health protocols. Indeed, after much reflection, we opted for the public health argument over the economic argument. Our rationale was that you can always revive an ailing economy, but we cannot bring to life those who die from the pandemic. And with this logic, informing our choices, we set out to build the irreducible minimums recommended by the experts to forestall a COVID disaster. Although the health argument won, we did not dismiss the economic argument to in total. We made fiscal choices to cushion the economy through a number of economic stimuli. And today I'm happy to go on record in this August House as having succeeded in the choices that our administration made. Because of our fiscal stimuli, today I can report that the impact of COVID on our economy was 14 times lesser than that on the global economy. As part of the first stimulus package, that we announced, we announced interventions that warranted the National Exchequer to go, forego taxes amounting to Kenya shillings 176 billion. These tax measures included the immediate reduction of VAT from 16% to 
to 14 percent, 100 percent tax relief for all persons earning up to Kenya shillings 24,000, reduction of pay as you earn from 30 percent to 25 percent, reduction of corporation tax from 30 percent to 25 percent. We also caused the lowering of the central bank rate, the CBR, to 7.25 percent from 8.25 percent so as to prompt commercial banks to lower interest rates applicable to their borrowers and thereby avail much affordable, much needed affordable credit to MSMEs across our country. We lowered the cash reserve ratio, the CRR, to 4.25% from 5.25% so as to provide additional li liquidity of approximately 35 billion to commercial banks in order to directly support borrowers that were distressed as a result of the economic effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Central Bank of Kenya also provided flexibility to banks with regard to the, requirement, the requirements applicable to loan classification and provision of loans that were performing as of the 2nd of March 2020. We further engaged banks and all financial institutions to support all enterprises and families that sought to restructure their commercial banking through debt moratoriums and review of tenure of these facilities. There was a temporary suspension of the listing of the credit reference bureaus of any person, micro, small and medium enterprise and corporate entities whose loans had fallen overdue or was in arrears. The Kenya Revenue Authority was directed to expedite the payments of all verified VAT refund claims amounting to some 10 billion shillings or an alternative allow for the offsetting of withholding VAT in order to improve cash flows for businesses. The 6 billion shillings from the Universal Health Coverage Kitty was immediately appropriated strictly towards supporting counties in the recruitment of additional health workers to support in the management of the spread of COVID-19. Subsequently, we rolled out the second stimulus package with the support of this house whose tenure tenant was an eight-point economic stimulus program amounting to some Kenya shillings 56.6 billion. The first element of the eight-point program focused on Buy Kenya, Build Kenya policy. On local infrastructure development, we allocated 10 billion towards the National Hygiene Program, dubbed Kazi Mtaani Initiative. The program was conceptualized as an extended public works project aimed at utilizing labor-intensive approaches to create sustainable public good in the urban development sector. The program has so far secured gainful engagement to over 750 youths engaged in the improvements to the environment and hygiene and in the rehabilitation of access roads, footbridges, and other public infrastructure through local labor. The second was on education, with an additional 6.5 billion to the Ministry of Education to hire an additional 10,000 teachers and 1,000 ICT interns to support digital learning and the acquisition of 250,000 locally fabricated desks. The third element of the program targeted small and medium enterprises through an injection of Kenya shillings 5 billion as seed capital for the SME credit guarantee scheme. The intention here was to provide affordable credit to small and micro enterprises. The fourth focused on universal health coverage through acquisition of locally made beds. The fifth element of the stimulus program focused on agriculture. We prioritized three billion for the supply of farm inputs through e-vouchers targeting 200,000 small-scale farmers, and a further 1.5 billion to assist flower and horticultural producers 
to access international markets in a period where we had a shortage of flights into and out of our country. Tourism was the sixth area of target for the stimulus program. To jumpstart this important sector and to protect its players from heavy financial losses, we provided soft loans to hotels and related establishments through the Tourism Finance Corporation, and a total of $2 billion was applied towards renovation of facilities and the restructuring of business operations by actors in this industry. To, impact, to mitigate the impact of deforestation and climate change and to enhance the provision of water, water facilities, we rehabilitated wells, water pans, and underground tanks in arid and semi-arid areas, and we applied Kenya Shilling's 2.5 billion for flood control measures and our Greening Kenya campaign. The eighth and final element was a stimulus program was manufacturing. A strategy we enforced, as a strategy, we enforced the policy on Buy Kenya, Build Kenya. And we set aside an initial investment of 600 million shillings to purchase locally manufactured vehicles. This was expected to sustain the operations of local motor vehicle manufacturers and their attendant employment of workers. Mr. Speakers, the foregoing interventions help to reinforce the resilience of our economy while cushioning millions of households against the effect on the, of the economy. And in that regard, while most economies in the world shrunk, Kenya's economy grew at 0.3 during the 2020 period, despite the COVID challenge. Although this positive growth was minimal, the second quarter of 2021 registered the most impressive growth ever recorded in our nation's real GDP. During the second quarter of 2021, real GDP recorded a phenomenal 10.1% growth, and this is the highest growth ever recorded in one quarter in Kenya's history. It is also the first time Kenya has hit a double-digit growth number. The last time Kenya's economy got close to this kind of performance was in 2010, during the Grand Coalition government, when the economy hit an 8.4% growth rate. And it was this impressive trajectory that led me to announce the 13-point interventions unveiled on Masujaa Day this year to cushion the economy with a further Kenya shillings 25 billion as our third stimulus package, pushing the aggregate of our stimuli over the COVID period to Kenya shillings 257 billion. The third stimulus package focused on the key productive and service sectors that covered agriculture, health, education, drought response, policy infrastructure, financial inclusion, energy, and environmental conservation. These 13 interventions were as follows. The first intervention was in the T subsector, where I am pleased to confirm that we have supported the T subsector with Kenya shillings 1 billion in support of fertilizer subsidy for our tea farmers, securing our nation's top agricultural export, and happy also to report that our tea farmers are today receiving the highest pay that they have received in many, many years. The second intervention was in the sugar subsector, and I note with satisfaction that smoke is once again billowing in our public sugar mills following the allocation of Kenya shillings 1.5 billion in aid of the sugar sector that is being applied towards factory maintenance and the payment of farmers arrears. The third intervention was in the coffee subsector and I confirm that 1 billion shillings was released in support of the ongoing reforms in the subsector that is being applied towards completion of the ongoing targeted interventions in the coffee subsector. The fourth intervention was in the livestock subsector. The Kenya Shillings 1.5 billion national livestock offtake program is on course 
in support of communities adversely affected by the ongoing drought in Asal counties. The fifth intervention was also in the livestock subsector, and I confirm that the interventions geared towards the reduction of the cost of animal feeds are well on course. The sixth intervention was in education. Noting the success of my administration's policy on 100% transition from primary to secondary school, I did direct that the National Treasury should allocate a further 8 billion shillings to the Ministry of Education for the CBC Infrastructure Expansion Program, targeting the construction of 10,000 classrooms. And I am most pleased to confirm to the nation that all the count, count, county's works and constructions of the classrooms should commence by early December 2021. The seventh intervention was in health, to enhance access to medical coverage across our country. And as part of our universal health coverage program, I did direct the Ministry of Health to establish an additional 50 new level three hospitals to be situated in both non-covered areas as well as densely populated areas across our nation and I also directed the National Treasury to allocate the sum of 3.2 billion for the immediate construction of these new medical facilities. The eighth intervention was a national sanitation program. We started this program, as I said earlier, to harness the energy of our young people and to give them a buffer against COVID-related unemployment. Noting the success of Kazi Mutaani program and its effect in enhancing opportunities for the youth across our country, we did require the National Treasury to allocate a further 10 billion shillings for the third phase of the Kazi Mtaani program to cover youths and to be rolled out in all our counties across the country. The ninth intervention was on energy and petroleum. Being fully aware of the positive strides being made in our economic recovery, and cognizant that the gains stand the risk of being eroded by high energy prices, I am pleased to confirm that we are on course to institutionalize the sought reforms. The tenth intervention was on access to credit. Critically, I asked the National Treasury and the Central Bank of Kenya to consider suspending the blacklisting of creditors with loans below Kenya shillings 5 million at the Credit Reference Bureau in a move that targeted retaining the bounce back potential of the foundation of our economy. As the 11th intent, I also asked the National Treasury and the Central Bank of Kenya to consider revising the maximum amount an individual or enterprise can withdraw or deposit from a bank that previously stood at 1 million shillings, which was not supportive of our current business environment. I'm glad to report to Parliament that as of the 8th November 2021, the Central Bank of Kenya issued a notice suspending the listing of negative credit information for borrowers with loans below Kenya shillings 5 million and that fell into arrears from October 1st, 2021 to September 30th, 2022. This will give the MSMEs 12 months to reorganize themselves and to adapt to the new economic normal. I am also happy to report that the Central Bank of Kenya is at an advanced stage of revising the 1 million threshold for cash deposits and withdrawals in the banks. This will facilitate easy transactions for MSMEs and help the economy respond to COVID shocks. The 12th intervention was a digital financial services subsector. In recognition of the importance of the digital financial services, especially in the small scale traders and households at large, I did direct the National Treasury to engage all digital payment providers with the aim of deepening and expanding the use of payment channels. The third intervention was a two-pronged, was two-pronged, 
one in the area of vaccination against COVID-19 as part of our national response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we rolled out a national vaccine deployment plan aiming at vaccinating 10 million adults by June of 2022 and approximately 16 million by June of 2023. With regard to the COVID-19 vaccine production, we have set out to implement the lessons of self-reliance, which, which was one of the key learning points of the pandemic. As the first step towards this goal, we established the Kenya Biovax Limited, a venture that would locally produce anti-COVID-19 vaccines. I therefore directed the Ministry of Health to operationalize the company to form and fill an, an eventual manufacture of our locally produced vaccines by Easter of next year. Honorable members, ladies and gentlemen, at this point I would like to take special note of the resilience of our revenue collection systems under the Kenya Revenue Authority. For the first time, KRA has exceeded its revenue collection target, target despite the COVID stress over the economy. The KRA projected a Kenya shillings 1.5 trillion collection in tax during 2020. They collected Kenya shillings 1.67 trillion, which was in excess of their projected intention. But on this note, I must report on the sterling performance of KRA, not only under the COVID duress, but in the last eight years of our administration. In the last eight, eight years, KRA has collected Kenya shillings 10.8 trillion cumulatively in revenues. This means that in just eight years, KRA has collected the equivalent of Kenya's total GDP. It also means that on average, KRA collected 1.3 trillion shillings every year. Honorable speakers, honorable members, to accelerate the turnaround of our micro, small, and medium enterprises under the ease of doing business government agenda, my administration has implemented remarkable reforms over the years. These measures have not only improved the country's business climate, they have also mitigated the challenge and bottlenecks impacting business. The key reform that we have implemented include the full automation of business registration services, re-engineering of the application for power, water, and sewer connection, and the automation of the land registration process. In addition, we have adopted e-payment, e-filing, and e-service at the commercial divisions of the High Court and fully operationalized the Small Claims Court, which has seen disputes involving SMEs, mostly our young people, being resolved within a record 60 days and thus freeing capital locked up in legal disputes. Equally important is the full automation and streamlining of the payment of taxes in order to ease the burden of compliance and the redesigning of the, important, of the import and export processes which has reduced the cost while improving efficiency of our ports among other notable reforms. Mr. Speakers, as an affirmation that our reforms on ease of doing business are bearing div dividend, just last week we scored a global first with the President of the European Investment Bank who was in the country to witness the official opening of the European Investment Bank's first regional hub outside the European Union. The Nairobi the Nairobi Regional Hub will cover 11 countries in Eastern and Central Africa and will act as a pilot for the setting up of other EIB regional hubs into the future. This speaks to our administration's agenda to position Nairobi as an international financial center. But an even better example of COVID resilience is the strengthened relationship between the national and county governments. Although the National and County Government Summit has operated smoothly since it became effective, 
I must admit that the COVID pandemic revitalized its energy. Whenever we gathered as a summit during this crisis, the consciousness of the entire nation was called to order. We put asunder the political dynamics of the moment and our only business became Kenya. We demonstrated in word and in deed that devolution is a powerful driver of social economic development and it creates synergies and acceleration points that in turn generates tangible benefits for all Kenyans. We understood very well that to overcome the crisis, we had to act as one. Rather than allowing the nation to succumb to COVID fatigue, we came together and galvanized our people towards strength, resilience, and building back better. We are otherwise, we, where, where others stumbled and fell, we rose and soared. During the COVID stress period, the national and county governments demonstrated their true leadership. Nothing demonstrates this better than the strengthening of our healthcare systems under the dark cover of the COVID-19 pressure. When the COVID pandemic hit our country, we had ICU, in, in, we had in ICU bed capacity only 180 beds countrywide. This translated to an average of two ICU beds in each county. But in the face of COVID, this reality was a disaster. But given the collaboration between the two levels of government, we increased ICU bed capacity by 502% during the COVID period. Equally important to note during the COVID-19 pandemic, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we had the capacity only to generate 3 million liters of oxygen per day in March of 2020. Today, I am proud to say that we have improved our oxygen generation capacity in public health facilities by 10 times to 32 million liters per day as of October 2021. Kenya can be proud of one more innovation. In March of 2020, we had only one laboratory that could test notifiable diseases of international concern. In fact, we had to send our tests for notifiable diseases to South Africa. When the COVID pandemic hit our country, we had to wait five days for the South African laboratories to send us results. Today, we have moved from one testing laboratory to 95 well-equipped laboratories. What is it then that we have learned from the COVID disaster? We have learned that our solutions must be homegrown. That is why we have commissioned a vaccine development project for disruptive viruses like COVID-19 to serve not only Kenya, but the region at large. Mr. Speakers, a national, another national reminder of the opportunities we seized during COVID-19 was the site of the Likoni Channel crossing in Mombasa. Previous scenes of Mombasa resi residents congested along the Likoni ferry are now a thing of the past. The iconic Likoni floating bridge, built in a record time of six months and open to the public in December 2020, sees over 150,000 residents cross the channel on a daily basis in, order, in an orderly, safe, and secure manner. This has not only allowed for the efficient management of time and mobility across the channel, but significantly moderated the incidences of COVID-19 transmission and contributed to our overall disease mitigation strategy in the coastal region. Kenya has taken pride of place through this, initi through this initiative, a first of its kind in the region, linking Liwatoni on Mombasa Island with Ras Bofu on the Likoni mainland, and we intend to adopt such innovative approaches and learning to deliver on similar challenges in our various sectors. 
In some, Mr. Speakers, COVID was both a danger and an opportunity. But because we focused on the opportunity side of the crisis, now Kenya has developed the necessary infrastructure for rolling out the universal health coverage outreach. But of equal importance, our COVID innovations in the area of health have propelled us to a place where Kenya can become a destination for health tourism for the region and beyond. Honorable members, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot end this COVID part of my address to Parliament without paying tribute to the people of Kenya for their commendable civic responsibility in the fight against COVID-19. While my administration provided leadership and action, our people supported us with self-sacrifice and civic duty. As you will recall very early in the pandemic, I did warn our people that the government cannot police the morality of its citizens. I warned that in a war burden, but it is a civic duty. I pay tribute to our fellow citizens for being responsible members of our communities. And indeed, as our forefathers stressed time and time again, our greatest strength will always be our unity. Today, I'm happy to report that despite the challenges and immense pressures and limits on our way of life, Kenyans did rise to the task and acted responsibly. Where others were reluctant, Kenyans gladly sacrificed for the good of the whole. For that reason, we were able to bend the curve and prevent the worst case scenarios. And due to this, and after careful consideration during the Mashuja Day celebrations, I lifted the curfew and restriction of movement countrywide. Once again, as we have always done, we have shown that Kenyans are a people who put country above self, neighbor above individual, and we are a people who firmly believe in exercising our rights and freedoms in a responsible and purposeful manner. While a few battles have been won, the war against COVID is not yet won, and we cannot rest on our laurels. Now more than ever, we are faced with yet another variant of this coronavirus, the Omicron vi variant that is said to carry a higher risk of, inf of infection. This variant may explain infection rate spikes that we are witnessing across the globe. I did pledge to the nation in June of this year that by Christmas we would have over 10 million adults vaccinated. As of today, we have achieved a target of 7.1 million Kenyans, up from 5 million as announced on Mashuja Day in October 2020. Mr. Speakers, to fortify our national resolve against COVID-19 and in honor of all those Kenyans that we have lost to the disease, I do urge today all Kenyan adults to visit their nearest medical facility to receive their COVID-19 vaccinations. The COVID-19 vaccines are in stock across our country and in all our counties, and already with a daily average rate of over 100,000 vaccinations, we have a much smaller target to meet within the next 25 days. I therefore once again call on all Kenyans to rally under the call of 25 days to Christmas to secure their vaccinations, to meet and surpass the target that we set ourselves. And I invite the media in all its various forums, forms to use their platforms to perform the social good and promote the vaccination campaign. This new variant's profile, as for now, remains unknown. It is therefore better to err on the side of caution. By receiving our vaccinations, we will have played our part in securing not only our own lives, but also in protecting the lives of those around us. Let us be responsible in this endeavor. That shot in the arm is the most powerful weapon against the disease that has ravaged the world. That shot in the arm of every adult Kenyan will also be a shot in the arm for our economy and our social institutions. 
It ensures that we can conquer, that if we can conquer and put this disease aside and fully return to normal, we can continue on our growth trajectory. No Kenyan should hold back from this perfectly safe and free way to protect yourself, your family, your neighbors, your colleagues, and the nation at large. Let us tear down this disease, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Speakers, throughout our history, the collective task of nation building has been guided by the shared aspirations of eradicating the indignities of ignorance, disease, and hunger. This was the vision that fueled our struggle for independence. Post-independence, every Kenyan generation and every administration since has sought to do all within its means to finally slay the three-headed monster that has plagued us for over many centuries to steer the nation towards a path for the realization of these aspirations, the people of Kenya entrusted the responsibility of actualization of that vision on the elected and appointed state officials and officers to whom the powers of our nation have been delegated to. These elected appointed state officers include 47 governors, 350 members of the National Assembly, 67 members of the Senate, and 2,240 members of the county assemblies. We are many, but we must act as one. One government of Kenya that acts in unison to give the people of Kenya a better present and a brighter future. Our collective contributions to move the nation closer to our destiny of a more fair, just, and equitable Kenya for all builds on the intentions of previous administrations as supported by the Houses of Parliament and the organs of the state. I say this fully aware of the enormous work, that this enormous work cannot be concluded in one generation. Ours is a relay race, where we receive the baton and run the race and pass it on to our successors unbroken. Mr. Speaker says, the most notable intergenerational quest is what inspired the Big Four agenda as a strategic guide for my second term in office. To do so, my administration and our colleagues in both tiers of government had to make commitments towards a transformation in four key areas of intent. The first one is liberating our people from the poverty of dignity caused by inadequate services. The second is transitioning our people, especially our youth, from being recipients of handouts to producers of goods and services, as well as owners of capital. The third is building a holistic base of human capital that is food secure and health assured. And the fourth is the restoration of the dignity and the pride inherent of one owning a decent home. Mr. Speakers, I will now give an account of what my administration has done not only in the last year, but what we have attempted to do in the last eight years as well. And I will use the last eight years to give this august houses a scale against which everything that my administration has achieved is to be measured. I will use history as a yardstick that we can borrow from to appreciate the achievements of our two tiers of government and our objective of delivery. The first area of thrust that I will report on is the state of our economic development. And I will borrow from the four legacy frames I articulated in my Madaraka Day speech of June 30th, 2020 in Kisumu City. Under the state of our economic development, I will report on two frames that have guided me and my administration. These are economic acceleration and the big push investments. Allow me, honorable members, to start with the economic acceleration 
which is increasing the speed of achieving our economic goals. I also use the word acceleration to imply the mechanism of multiplying our economic fundamentals. When my administration took office in April of 2013, we were eager to multiply what was bequeathed to us. And I am happy to report to this parliament that we have multiplied our critical fundamentals in ways that even I did not imagine possible. For instance, in 2013, Kenya was Africa's 12th, 12th wealthiest nation with a GDP of 4.7 or 4.74 trillion Kenya shillings. This GDP was accumulated in a span of 123 years through four administrations before ours because I include the colonial administration. In just eight years, my administration has multiplied the GDP by a factor of two plus. Today, our GDP stands at Kenya shillings 11 trillion, up from the 4.75 trillion, and from being ranked, and from being ranked as the 12th wealth, wealthiest nation in Africa when I took over, we have now moved six ranks to become the sixth wealthiest nation in the continent on account of the choices that we have made. And as I said earlier, in the second quarter of this year, our real GDP grew by 10.1%, the first such growth in the history of our economy. The notable contributions to this growth include the ICT sector, which grew by a significant 25.1% in the second quarter of 2021. In fact, the ICT sector is projected to become a prime mover of our economic growth in years to come. Other sectors that contributed significantly to the real GDP in the, re in the reference quarter include the transport, se transport sector, which grew by 16.9%, and manufacturing, which grew by a record 9.6%. However, the hotel industry presents a more compelling picture of recovery from the COVID menace. At the height of the COVID pandemic in 2020, this industry registered a negative growth of 63.5% in the third quarter of 2020. Dur during the first quarter of 2021, this industry showed some improvement and contracted by 48.8%. By the second quarter of 2021, this industry was on a path of recovery and had grown by 9.1%, showing a remarkable upturn. Here, I look forward to all our international and global partners. COVID will not be defeated by locking us all down and by shutting off parts of the world that you think are problematic. No one will be safe from COVID until we are all safe. Please, Jameni, tumefanya kazi, musitufungie tena Jameni. Honorable members, ladies and gentlemen, given that we have doubled our GDP in a record eight years, it is no wonder that Kenya is projected to grow twice as fast as the sub-Saharan economies in the period of 2021 to 2022. And all this because of leadership and the power of choice. Allow me to give further example of acceleration and the multiplication of our fundamentals as a strategic intent of my administration. Administrations in 123 years, like I said, I include the colonizers as well. In eight years, my administration has multiplied what the previous administrations have done by a factor of two. We have built 10,500 kilometers of road across the Republic and doing so 15, 15 times faster than previous administrations. And I will expound on this in a little while. Our rail, 
with Madaraka Express having served over 6,495,000 passengers while our cargo gets to the stores of our enterprises efficiently and on time with a record of 17.6 million tons of cargo transported from the 1st of January 2018 to yesterday, the 29th of November 2021. Turning to power generation, our acceleration model was applied to the production and distribution of electricity countrywide. When I took the oath of office in 2013, Kenya's total grid was 1,300 megawatts. But eight years later, Kenya's total grid has doubled and now stands at 2,600 megawatts. And this translates to approximately 325 megawatts installed every year under my administration. It means that for every year, we have installed 325 megawatts since 2013. But this is not the only thing in Kenya. It's not the only thing which Kenya is leading the continent. I am proud to report that we have connected more power than in any other part of the country in just six years. In fact, Kenya is the leading country in Africa with respect to household connection electricity. In the eight years, we have connected 1.7 million more homes. No, sorry, we have collected, connected 1.7 million more households than Egypt. Similarly, we have connected as many households as South Africa and Nigeria combined during the eight years of my administration. In real terms, only 2.3 million households had been connected to power when I took over in 2013. In eight years, we have tripled this number by connecting an extra 6.3 million households. Put differently, and guided by our acceleration model, we have connected approximately 787,000 households every year on average, and with 2,000 connections a day since 2013. By any measure, this acceleration is noteworthy. Besides access to electricity, my administration has embarked on implementing the recommendations of the Presidential Task Force that established a pathway for the reduction of the cost of electricity by 30% by the end of this year. Mr. Speaker, we are tearing down all barriers that deny Kenyans an opportunity to lead a dignified life. Now I turn to devolution and how my administration has used the acceleration framework to multiply the economic fundamentals of the counties. As the first president to implement the 2010 constitution, the task of rolling out devolution fell squarely on me. And although the letter of the constitution provided for a phased approach to devolution, to the devolution of functions, to counties, the spirit of the Constitution suggested an urgent Big Bang approach in creating the devolved structures. This meant giving county governments political, administrative, and financial autonomy all at once. And we were to do this without the luxury of a strategy dry run to determine whether the Big Bang approach would work. Fortunately, Article 187 of the Constitution gave us three years to execute this constitutional instruction. While three years was a fair period to achieve the Big Bang effect of transferring functions to fragile counties, my administration chose an even bolder path. Driven by our acceleration doctrine, we chose to transfer functions to the county structures in one year instead of the constitutional threshold of three years. And because we were committed to the success of the countries, of the county's structures, we followed our accelerated devolution of function with two critical drivers. One, we undertook a massive transfer of highly skilled civil servants from the national government to the county governments. And this battery of highly trained personnel was meant to give county governments a head start. And they did so in terms of setting up the county public services, including their operating structures 
and systems. Two, within the first year of my tenure, my administration increased the equitable share allocation to county governments from the constitutionally mandated 15% to 32%. This was a doubling of the allocation in support of the execution of the devolution dream. And we did this because we understood and appreciated that devolution of functions without devolving of funding was an exercise in futility. Today, the national government has disbursed approximately 2.4 trillion to county governments over the last eight years. The aggregate amount that will have been dispersed to the counties for the next financial year will ensure that this figure surpasses the three trillion mark. In other words, this percolation of resources changed the economic fundamentals at the county level. It has fast-tracked the embeddedness of devolved functions in eight years, and evidence abounds on this, but allow me to give a few examples. Accelerated devolution has, for instance, delivered shoes with a magical label made in Kitui County, Kenya, and given Makueni County its first mango processing plant. Makueni County received 110 million from the Devolution Advice and Support Program. This money supported the processing plant and benefited 12,000 mango farmers by creating value addition. That plant is now buying one mango at 15 shillings from farmers who previously, who previously sold their produce in the open marketplace at five shillings, at the very best. other than let their mangoes rot away. Their incomes have grown tenfold and provided ground for their farming undertakings to take off. Makueni is also on record as being one of the counties with the capacity to manufacture its own oxygen, especially in the context of COVID-19. And their universal health care insurance scheme, known as Makueni Care, is also a good example. Another example of county innovation is in Kajiado. In the wake of COVID-19 pandemic, the county looked for a way of distributing food to members of its populace through an integrated system dubbed, dubbed M. Riziki, which virtually linked financiers and beneficiaries, 30,000 households of their population in Kajiado were able to receive food using the system in 2020. M. Riziki saved the county the logistical nightmare of transportation and the digital platform also ensured that shopkeepers who partnered with the county were pro to, to provide goods remained in business during the COVID duress. This innovative approach in distributing relief food closed off avenues of corruption and created highly efficient ways of delivering services to the population. Honorable members, there are many more testimonials on how accelerating the formation of county structures and supporting them with skilled personnel, resources, and legislation has embedded devolution in the last eight years. One sleepy towns across the country have now roared back into life driving not just grand infrastructure projects, but also tangible increases in household in incomes of ordinary Kenyans. Mr. Speakers, as devolution takes root, and as an affirmation of the equitable development we continue to enjoy, and in keeping with the resolution of the Senate, I will tomorrow, the 1st of December 2021, have the high privilege on confer of conferring on Nakuru Municipality city status. Nakuru City will join Kisumu, Mombasa, and Nairobi as cities, and with their reputation as East Africa's cleanest town, all of Kenya looks forward to Nakuru City growing by leaps and bounds. So, honorable members, I am happy to report to this august house 
that my administration has laid a firm and sound foundation for the devolved system of government, a foundation that has the potential to multiply the economic fundamentals of our county economies imme Im immeasurably. Ladies and gentlemen, you may ask why we choose to accelerate certain goals in our development agenda. Why do we choose to accelerate the issuance of title deeds, double our road network, build brand new railway lines, double our power production, double our GDP? Why has my administration taken such tremendous strides in creating accelerated development? Honorable members, it took England 200 years to industrialize. It took the United States of America 160 years and Japan 110 years. However, we look not to these nations, but to China, which has compressed their progressive economic change experience by these countries into a single generation. Instead of taking 200 years, instead of taking the 200 years it took England to industrialize, China took only 25 years. Similarly, the four Asian tigers of Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, and the Republic of South Korea took 25 years to industrialize instead of the hundreds of years it took others. And that is why their accelerated growth was called the Asian miracle. The secret to these miracles was acceleration. The Asian tigers, for instance, accelerated the achievement of its critical development fundamentals, and this allowed them to industrialize at a rate that was faster than normal. They contracted their development timelines by implementing aggressive interventions on multiple sectors of their economy simultaneously. This reduced the intervals between the phases of industrialization and allowed them to catch up with the West. And like these countries, the policy choices of my administration have been about contracting our development timelines through aggressive implementing, implementation of projects. We are moving with speed because there is no time like the present to deliver the dreams of Kenyans for a better tomorrow. If the acceleration model has worked for the Asian Tigers, who were at the same level of development as Kenya in 1965, they can work for us too. And if these countries industrialized in 25 years because of bold choices they made, we too can set the path for economic transformation and achieve it in record time, especially if we stop stealing. Mr. Speaker, allow me, allow me to report on the second frame of my development agenda, which I referred to in my Madaraka Day speech of this year as the Big Push Investments. These are the bold undertakings that are futuristic in outlook. Most of these interventions are in the form of roads, rail, and ports. Some of them are revival of dead capital installed by previous administrations, which are nonetheless critical to our development path today. Regarding roads, the handiwork of my administration is evident across the entire country. There are some counties that have received their first tarmac roads since God made Kenya. And this was done during my administration. And as I said earlier, in eight years, we have built approximately the same number of kilometers of road that were built by the colonizers and the three previous independent administrations. And although our achievements in this area cannot be gainsaid, I want to reiterate that my administration was not building roads for their own sake. Ours was a quest to lay down tarmac, for not for statistical purposes only. We realized that roads are literally the path to development and that every inch of tarmac we lay, we are accelerating businesses, creating the foundation for greater individual and national prosperity. We did it for you, the Kenyan people, to tear down the barriers that hold back every citizen from making their individual contributions to nation building. 
Take as an example the 27-kilometer Nairobi Expressway. Once completed next year, it will take 24 minutes to drive from Mlolongo in Machakos County to Rironi in Kiambu County. Currently, this journey takes three hours, which is the equivalent of flying from Addis Ababa, flying to Addis Ababa and back to Kenya. Let me add that plans for the dual carriageway from Rironi, where the Nairobi Expressway will terminate, to Mao Summit are also at an advanced stage. And once completed, it will take 45 minutes to drive from Nairobi to Naivasha. Across the Republic, in every region, we are converting dusty Maram roads to world-class roads. Our dream is to create an efficient road network that links towns, cities, ports, stations, and markets to consumers. Over the last eight years, and for the first time since independence, Kenya is now linked to four of its five neighbors by tarmac roads. This is how we are facilitating the economic integration of our region, tearing down every barrier to the realization of our shared aspirations as a people. For instance, by linking our road networks to the Northern Corridor, we are plugging into the multimodal trade route that links the landlocked countries of the Great Lakes region with the Kenya Maritime Seaport of Mombasa. Similarly, the East African Coastal Corridor Development Project will link us along the coastline from Malindi through to Lunga Lunga up to Bagamoyo in Tanzania and on to Dar es Salaam. The corridor will promote tourism and trade along the Indian Ocean coast. Of equal note is the Sierrare Corridor, which will form an integral link to the northern coast. Sudan at Nakadok. With regard to ports, the development of Lamu port has been of particular pride to my administration. The port was first conceptualized in 1972, nine years after we gained independence. However, it took 39 years for works on the Lamu, port of Lamu to commence. Through our futuristic model of big push investment, we have made it a reality in only eight years. The port of Lamu is the only post-colonial seaport in Africa built and financed by an African government. All, all other major, major seaports were built in the late 1800s or 1900s when most of Africa was under colonial rule. This port is therefore significant in terms of the futuristic thinking of our country. We are also in the process of building a road from Lamu through to Garissa and Isiolo, linking up to the Isiolo Moyale Road and opening up the port of Lamu and the huge potential that exists in northern Kenya and with our partners also in Ethiopia. End of part one. <laughs> <laughs> interval, interval. <laughs>